Today I want to talk a bit about the essence of JavaScript. The paper that we're using as a guideline for our implementation on taking simple JS and converting it into Lambda.js. So the essence of JavaScript uh, was created by three authors, Arjun Guha, Claudio Stafui, and Shriram Krishan Namurthy, from all from Brown University. And the link to read the paper is accessed. You can follow it by clicking here. Um, and I want to read the abstract just so you get a kind of a baseline of what we're doing. Uh, so the authors reduced JavaScript to a core calculus. Think of calculus as just a very simple language uh, without any kind of niceties that a user would want, but small as possible so that um, someone can Someone who wants to do a theoretical um, reasoning doesn't have to deal with um, intricacies that are just interesting for who wants to use them. You want it to be easy to prove. So whenever you read calculus, just think of it a programming language that is easy to make proofs. Structures as a small step semantics and the small step uh, operational semantics is um, it's similar to what we've learned. What we've learned is known as a big step operational semantics. Operational semantics is just looking or, or trying to define the meaning of a programming language in terms of its ex execution, and it's centered around its state. So the state of a program, as we've seen, it's basically the, pro the AST, and uh, as we saw in homework uh, five, the heap as well. So homework uh, four, you had a language that the sole state was just the program itself and then we would rewrite the program whenever we were executing it and execution is so far what we've seen is that execution is a recursive function that goes through and evaluates the whole expression until it becomes finally a value small step operational semantics just as the minimum amount amount you can possibly do so it, it's it's just so you imagine if you were implementing Instead of recursively, you were implementing it in a loop uh, where at each iteration you would make the expression smaller and smaller by executing it. Small step operational semantics just tries to do what is inside the loop. So the smallest thing you can do at each iteration. So you just apply the, um, so for instance, in function application, you would just do perform the substitution, but you wouldn't execute the body of the function. You would leave that to the next step. Uh, we present several peculiarities of the language and show that our calculus models them. So the authors include kind of a, a benchmark full of examples that showcase the difficulty of implementing JavaScript and how their tool is able to cope with them with such uh, difficult cases. We explicate, explicate the desugaring process, which is what you are implementing in this homework eight, that turns JavaScript programs into ones in the core. So ones in the core, here the core is Lambda.js, which is the target language. We demonstrate the faithful to JavaScript using real world test suits. So they do use um, existing test suits that uh, Firefox and other browsers use to make sure that their implementation makes sense. Finally, we illustrate the utility by defining a security property, implementing it as a type system on the core, and extending it to a full language. So what they're trying to say to mean by this is that a type system is just a set of rules that you can perform some kind of compile time analysis, or, or just by looking at the source code, you can do some kind of analysis on the code. And the type system is just a a way to specify this analysis of code in terms of rules like we're doing in terms of execution in terms of rules, right? We are defining the rules, the, the meaning, the semantics of uh, record by means of rules. This is known as the operational semantics, right? Um, type system is when you're, the type system is for practical matters is when you're defining in terms of rules, the analysis, the algorithm that is analyzing source code, not transforming it in any way. So they, they implement the rules that are trying to, that are concerned with some security property that is explained in the paper. 
Um, so this is kind of like the outline of the paper. They introduced JavaScript, and then they present the translation from JavaScript to Lambda.js, and then they demonstrate the faithfulness of of their implementation with test suits, and finally they illustrate the utility of Lambda.js with this language extension, which is they propose some small language extensions to, to make the language more secure. Um, so the operational semantics and the way they write the rules can be seen here in this slide. As you can see, it's kind of similar, although they have this notation here is just to show an object showing like with ellipses saying, oh, this is the first string for the first field and the first value, dot, dot, dot. This is the nth field and the nth value and so on. So usually when I showed you the rules, I didn't show them by comprehension, but it kind of makes it, if you're familiar with this notation, it kind of makes it simpler. Uh, so in a way, it's just, if you recall how we've learned the dot, dot, dot notation in macros and in pattern matching, it's the same use being used here. Um, so what kind of tools does the essence of JavaScript include in it? So usually in programming language theory papers, such as the essence of JavaScript, there's a big emphasis in supplying tools, not just uh, theoretical results. So the theoretical result is really very important, and it, it probably accounts for 70% of the paper, but without a tool, it's kind of doesn't show a lot of the practicality. And in this case, although not everything is covered in the paper, they do have the project, the research project in itself has quite a few tools that I I advise you to just look at it because they're, they're interesting and they're related to what you've been working on. So if you're curious of what kind of tools you can do in programming language theory, this is a good starting point as it will give you a few good examples of what can be done. So first thing is Lambda.js, and this is similar to what you've implemented in Homework 5 and Homework 4. Um, so they have this available. If all of these links are clickable, so if you click on them, you'll get to a repository or a, a, a particular subdirectory of, of a certain directory. So this is how these are all the files that they use to implement the interpreter. That is also, which is also included in Homework 8, actually. So Lambda.js is included in Homework 8, as you probably know. Uh, then they have another directory for the translator from JS to Lambda.js. And this you can actually use as an inspiration if you're stuck, uh, if you, in terms of homework eight. So you can definitely use uh, this directory and the source code. I'll show you a few examples where, where the, the source code kind of matches the expectation. So you can use, you can uh, use this directory to kind of guide you for homework. And then they also include uh, formal semantics. And this is, to put it very simply, it's mostly how you define, again, Lambda.js and in Coq. Basically, that's it. So it's more interest. it would be more interesting if you were doing like proofs on, on top of Lambda.js, but I don't think they, they even have proofs on, on here. Perhaps they do, I actually don't know. Let me see. Mm. Yeah, this is not typical cock code, though. This is very... Um, <laughs> yeah, this is a lot of... This is very... Let's say very advanced in quotation marks. It does have a lot of um, proof engineering code. Ah, they do show progress and... So probably types on this as well. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So this is uh, they they actually do prove some results on it. So it's kind of quite an interesting. Ah, they do yeah preservation as well. Yeah. So these are classical results that if you ever take CS seven twenty with me, you would know about. But otherwise, uh, you can ignore. Uh, but just know that. Whenever you're designing a programming language in programming language theory, there are certain results that are very important to to prove, and that and two of them are actually intuitive. Is you kind of want to make sure that um, your programming language passes a few sanity checks, and one of which is you know if you have a certain program execution, um, or actually if you think about it, 
any program that you run should not kind of void the or or break the interpreter that's usually the ba basic thing right you want to be able to run any throw any program that you want and it shouldn't crash the browser right it shouldn't crash javascript um, interpreter in your browser so there's actually a way to formulate that notion in uh, theory so if you are able to specify your interpreter with rules like i showed you in in this course uh, and actually formalize them using cock, then you are able to prove that no program will defeat the interpreter. As long as you assume that the interpreter was implemented according to the rules and exactly that. So any bug that you might have is just because you didn't follow the rules properly. But if you were to follow the rules, then such result would show that all programs will, uh, no program will break the interpreter. So that's that's basically what they're trying to prove over there. Um, then they also have um, OCaml version of the same code and translator. So if you're interested, if you are more familiar with OCaml or if you're curious about um, how OCaml looks, I think you might have heard of me talking about OCaml. OCaml, again, is, is the same kind of idea of what they did, but they kind of supported more of JavaScript as a, as a language. So this is um, a re-implementation re of the same project in a new language that actually supports more JavaScript than before. And the basic, the, basically the two repositories you want to look at are these two. So all of the links above are contained in these two repositories. So, but these are just direct links to actually sub-projects. Okay, so this is what we have in terms of um, the essence of JavaScript. I've, I wanted to close with just two more slides that kind of show you or relate how this is the translator code is translating JavaScript. It's not translating simple JavaScript. So, of course, the code will be a bit more complicated, but in the end, it will be in a ballpark close to what we have. So I, I wanted to kind of show you a rule that we have and then how it's implemented. Generally, when you implement it, you, you have m way more code than in, in math. In math, you, uh, you kind of do cheat a bit, and so things look way shorter. That's the principle. The idea is, the objective is really to present things in a comprehensive, in a simple way, uh, rather than just trying to be very obtuse in how programming languages actually work. So this is Haskell. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But um, regardless, I just wanted to kind of point you, point your direction, your attention to the code highlighted in blue. And what I want to show you is that it kind of follows the same idea of what you're expected to do in Reckit. So, for instance, one thing that you have to do is, um, well, you have to do two things, right? At the outermost, you want to do this, right? You want to read a string, the field Y on an object. Um, so which object? The object is given by this expression. So that's why in Haskell you see get field is the outermost expression, and then you have two param parameters, right? The first parameter highlighted in blue would match this parameter highlighted here, and then the second parameter highlighted in blue, uh, which is here, connects to um, this highlighted in blue. So let's kind of unpack this uh, step by step. So here is get field, as you learned, the notation is for the brackets, right? Um, and what is the out A1 and A2, you can ignore it. It's just to know where the source location is. So you can, you can kind of ignore these fields all the time. Uh, and if you do that, that kind of might, makes it way simpler to understand what you, what's going on. So, so then what do we have? First thing we have is a deref. And notice that here we have a deref, deref as well. And it's not by chance, you know? We are translating, after all, a very similar language, so that kind of the rules will match the, the Haskell code as well. So then what we have, this is, again, source code location. You can ignore that. And then what we have, we have the expression that we're trying to... Where is the expression? The expression x. Where is x given? Let's see. E. Ah, okay. So E is here. Um, so the way they get object e they kind of have to do something with it so you can uh, you can ignore this part but basically this is the e which matches x and it's given here so this is dot ref okay sorry i should have let me go back a bit 
So on the left hand side of the rule, you have this, which will match the input, right? So what we have here is a dot ref, right? Because this is a dot notation to read something. So whenever you want to read a field, um, so E is going to correspond to X. And then the Y is this, right? So here is actually um, in record would be a symbol, right? The symbol that represents Y, uh, which is inside a, a J colon variable, right? So now, or a S colon variable. So then what we want to do is want to take the symbol and kind of convert it to a string. Uh, that's here, and that is done in this uh, step right here. So here they're converting a symbol to a string. That's done here in this code. And you will have to do that in the homework gate as well. And then this is basically the ref of x. So this whole thing, you can ignore it, and it's just the ref of e, and e corresponds to x. So it's just to show you that it is quite close to what you want. So it would be just a dot ref, not the other yellow thing. Okay, so this is mostly it. Um, next thing I wanted to show you is kind of like this big one. I did uh, update the slides to make it easier to parse this, but I just wanted to show you that when you're trying to generate the code for a function application, you have to do quite a bit of things, right? And this is the Haskell code that kind of corresponds to that. And what you'll see is that you will have um, get field of this. So the, this is uh, here. Okay, so this part corresponds to this part. And notice that they have the code here. So that corresponds to this part. Um, and then there's a get field of code. So that would be uh, this thing. And then outside of that, they have a function application. So these are the arguments. And the body is this whole big thing, right? And then the innermost deref of x, you see here as well. Um, I don't see where the they are reading the y. Oh, because this is a generalized. Thing. So this is not actually translating a method call, but it is very close to it. So there's a part that is kind of a generalized. So they are not they're not performing the lookup of the object. So they don't, they don't do this part right here. They only do the outer mob, most part. So they only do this part. Okay. So looking up code and then calling the function. But as you can see in in our code and in our, in our sorry in our um, homework eight and also in the in their tool they both use the the dollar sign code for representing the field that contains the code and I did it because they they are doing it and that's basically it. you can click on on this link and, and go through the GitHub location where it kind of shows you where the code is and supposedly matches. Um, okay, and in the next video, I'm going to go through the LimdaJS formal specification.